actually going to set a timer because now I'm really nervous. <laughs> uh, 40 minutes, let's do this. I hope everyone's had a really good time today. The cool thing about going last is that you get to see how amazing all the other talks are, and then there's absolutely no pressure at all to close out the conference, so it's great. <laughs> Um, so this is the title that Remy wanted it to be. Uh, <laughs> um, I call it Alternative Interfaces, but uh, Tales from the Nodiverse is actually a very uh, apt description as well. Um, so I, as Remy mentioned, I'm Sue Sinton, and I tend to do a lot of hardware stuff in my spare time. Um, but I also work at Stripe, and I sort of do hardware stuff at Stripe as well, because we have a hardware offering, uh, which is really cool, called Terminal. Um, but there's a big divide between you know, my personal hobby stuff and like, what I do professionally, and so I'm gonna be sharing my hobby stuff tonight. So this evening's topics uh, are web USB, web Bluetooth, and web serial. They're three, well, one of them's not super new, but there's, uh, they're kind of new-ish hardware-related APIs that you can use with JavaScript in the browser, which is really exciting. Um, the thing is, though, that if you've seen any of my other talks, um, I apologize because I've sort of done a review of them recently and I've realized that some of them, not all of them, but some of them are kind of like this. <laughs> and like, that's not good. <laughs> um, you know, I sort of go, oh, there's this like API and you just call it in JavaScript and then like something in between and then magic, right? And it's not cool and it's kind of given me this reputation that I'm some hardware witch. That's not, you know, and I want to sort of dispel that, right? I don't want it to be this impenetrable knowledge. So let's ban that. So instead, tonight's agenda is, is still about web Bluetooth, web USB, web serial, uh, but it's more about, like, who's calling me right now? Anyway, uh, <laughs> it's more about vehicles, protocols, ownership, and the web agenda. Um, and hopefully you'll have less fear about what that magic bit is in between, um, because I want to sort of do a little fun exercise with you so that uh, we can break down some barriers when it comes to things like just figuring out how to talk to all of this stuff. So let's get into that fun exercise. You're at work, uh, and you're just like minding your own business, and then all of a sudden your manager, and you're like, oh. all right, what's up? I need you to design a protocol for this new text displaying robot we're developing. And you're like, yeah, okay, but I've never done hardware before. I just do web pages. And you're like, yeah, I'm going to get out of this for sure. And he's like, yeah, hey, it's all just computers, right? Just uh, show me a proposal by end of day tomorrow. And you're just like, ah, OK. Um, and then a couple of minutes later, he sends through. <laughs> that's his real name. <laughs> he sends through some more helpful specs, right? So the hardware engineers have designed this robot that needs to be able to, like, it needs to be able to have a protocol so that you can give it text and it knows how to format that text, right? You know. This sounds like a whiteboard interview, I promise it's not. Um, so you have USB data transfer, that's how this is actually, the robot's gonna talk to the computer. Uh, it needs to be really fast to pass, so don't create this overly convoluted protocol with lots of stuff in it. Uh, it needs to be human usable at the same time, so humans can really easily understand and, and also program in that protocol. Um, and it needs to support the following text properties. Underline text, bold text, strike through text, character fonts, text justification, and line feeds. You know, it's not a lot there. It's easy. Oh, and one more thing. You can't use existing protocols because, of course, you know, because this is capitalism and you work for the man, um, they want to be able to patent this protocol. So you have to completely invent it from scratch and you can't sort of use anything existing, right? Because, you know, ha-ha business. <laughs> so you're like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure this out. Um, so usually in this case you think, okay, what is the simplest thing we could do? Let's break this right down. It's exactly the same as when your boss gives you a weird web component to have to design, right? What's the simplest thing we could do? This is a text formatting robot. So maybe we could just use ASCII because we're probably going to be sending it text that's part of either the ASCII or the extended ASCII table. So why don't we just kind of like design this whole protocol around ASCII and then it's human readable seems super easy. So here is like just the basic ASCII table. This is not the extended one. If you haven't seen it before, so you can see all of the letters and numbers and symbols and things. Uh, if we were using English text, for example, so when I have that as a caveat, um, is there. So we're like, all right, you know, you can send all of this text. Um, but also at the top, uh, there's also line feed. 
and our robot had to be able to understand when we want a line feed in order to you know, pass that. So line feed in the bag, tick. Uh, being able to actually send text in the first place, tick. Cool. Um, but we have a lot of other things that we need to do as well. But let's just look at these two features, right? Text and line feed. So for the protocol structure, we have to like send bytes over the USB cable to the robot. What if we just send strings over the, the, uh, the cable? And you know, you can break them down into their actual ASCII decimals in order to send that as bytes. But for example, let's say on the human side, we type in hello world to the computer. We use a magical uh, web API to send it over USB. Uh, and the robot just gets hello world if you write hello world. Uh, and then if you write hello and then the line feed character, which I've just sort of abstracted in this way, you'll get hello, but then the machine will know, oh, okay, they want to go to a new line, so I'm gonna format the text that way. Cool, done, right? Yeah, no, we still got underline and all of that. So we've taken care of line feed, we've taken care of text. What about commands? Like, how do we use ASCII in order to also tell it, oh, I want this underlined and things like that? Well, let's have a look at the ASCII table again. And there's a, there's a number of characters at the top that aren't really expressing like words or symbols or letters or things that we usually pass in the English language, right? So we have things like null, not sure that's super useful. Uh, we have our line feed, of course. We have things like carriage return and things like that. But I'm sort of like, I'm seeing one that is kind of obvious, that's still understandable and rememberable to us, uh, or so memorable, that we could probably use. And I'm thinking escape. What if we just use escape? Because when would you ever want to express escape in text? You know, I think that um, you've probably seen the number 27 before if you've done anything to do with like web modals. So if you've had to pop up a web modal and you want to make it so that when someone hits escape, it goes away, please do that. If you don't do that, please do that. <laughs> so you might have seen something like, you know, you're checking the key press number and if it's 27, that's because it's the ASCII reference to the escape key. So if you didn't know that, that's the connection there. So we could probably use the escape key given that like nobody ever really uses that when expressing things in text. So what if we made our protocol, like we have our line feeds and our normal text, but if we wanted to format something like an underline or a strike through, what if we had the escape character immediately followed by another ASCII character, but because they're next to each other, our robot knows, okay, the next character is gonna be like a letter or something, but it's actually gonna be telling me something important about the text that I need to format. So basically we could have escape and then our command letter. So let's just come up with some extremely arbitrary decisions here. The first one makes total sense. Let's do escape and E for like bold or emphasis. And then any text that follows that will end up being bold until you toggle it again. So let's treat these as toggles. The first time it sees escape E, it knows to turn it on. The next time it encounters it, it knows to turn it off. Let's not have to like worry about state or anything like that. Then let's just do escape plus G for strike through, even though there's no G in strike through, we'll, we'll just do it, you know? It's, it's our protocol. And then we'll just throw complete caution to the wind and use uh, a hyphen for underline because yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so in this case, here is kind of what we put in as humans, and I've just highlighted the command part at the beginning in a different color. Uh, if you are colorblind, it's red. So, um, but basically it will be the escape um, character, and then E, and then followed by just regular text will come out as bold hello world, right? Then the next one is escape G with like, again, we continue our string. That would be strike through, um, and then the uh, hyphen will be underscore, cool. So that's satisfied almost all of the requirements in the email. If you remember though, we needed to have font type and also justification. So justification is like whether you want it to be to the left, to the center, to the right. Um, and font type is really just, this robot knows to display text in certain fonts. So we wanna give people a choice. Um, it was left off the email, but I followed up with the manager later and there was three font choices. So there's three font choices and there's three justification types. So let's look at these two. Let's just use like capital M for font type, because why not? And then let's, uh, let's break with tradition and use a, a lowercase a for justification, because there's an A in justification. <laughs> it's fine, it's great. I'm heaps good at protocols. So in this case, we need to have an additional uh, character, right? So we have to say, all right, escape, we're about to send you a command. Uh, so like M for the font type, okay, so you know that we're about to pick a font, but then the following thing is going to be which font. 
So we can just do a numerical system for that. It's either font zero, font one, or font two. Uh, and then I've put left justify, center justify, and right justify as the exact same command, escape A, but we, we're just appending a zero, or one, or a two on the end, so it knows to do that. So it's added a little bit of complication to our protocol, but it's still not a lot to pass, right? And so if our robot sees escape and M, it knows, well, we can program it, and we can tell the hardware engineers to look for an additional character afterwards. Cool. So I think that was it. I think we satisfied all, the, uh, all of the um, requirements in the email. We go back to chat. We're like, all right, here it is. Done. <laughs> so like, you know, did that in 24 hours, it's fine. But like, is that real? Like, is that actually how you design hardware protocols? Like, do you just kind of pick something and just go with it, and then, you know, it sticks around? And is this actually, like, patentable? Like, could you actually say, yes, you use the escape character with arbitrary letters, and that's how patent? Well, I have news for you. This is actually an existing protocol. <laughs> uh, we're going to be using it today. It's called Escape P. <laughs> uh, and it is... The worst backronym that Epson has come up with, it is the Epson standard code, but it also spells escape, so that's pretty cool. Uh, it's the Epson standard code for printers. It's a printer, printer control language developed by Epson, obviously, uh, to control computer printers. Uh, and it was a popular mechanism to add formatting to printed text, which is what we actually just did. Uh, and it was widely uh, supported in software, and it was also patented. Um, so only Epson could use it. Um, but the, it was an extremely popular um, protocol, uh, despite that. But you're probably like, Suze, did you just teach me a completely useless protocol <laughs> over the last, you know, 10 minutes? What am I, like, supposed to do with this? I don't have a bookstore where I'm selling books and I don't need to print people receipts. This is not my job. Um, well, there was a pretty cool use of thermal printers back in the 90s, and it wasn't just what Epson was doing with Escape P. Um, so, showing my age, but does anybody remember this? <laughs> yeah, it was pretty cool. I loved it. Um, so, I never had one of these, but I did have that Game Boy, exactly. Um, and then I borrowed the camera and printer off a friend whose parents were much better off than mine. Uh, <laughs> and I was completely obsessed with it, and I probably used like all of her rolls of thermal paper. Um, but essentially, you could take selfies. This is in the 90s. Uh, you could take selfies. I think it was, yeah, it was in the 90s. I think I was like, I'm not going to say how old I was, but anyway. Uh, I borrowed this off my friend, and you could like do these frames. There was this default Nintendo Game Boy frame, and you printed it out, and it was like basically ahead of its time selfie, but the camera also swiveled, so you could actually turn it and then take pictures of other stuff. And like Remy had a really cool camera at the speaker dinner the other night, and it made me think of that, and I got really excited about it, so that was really cool. But yeah, okay, cool, but you know, you can buy these things off eBay, and they may or may not work, but here's the thing, like, we're not electrical engineers, and this would have taken so, so, so long for Nintendo to come up with, and they have a lot of money, um, and also, yeah, just like highly qualified stuff. So this is a pretty big jump from escape P to like having to do something like this. Uh, or is it? So what, what if we could make this with the web? Like let's look at all of the tools that we have in the browser now with all of the really cool APIs and see if we can make this work. So the first thing we need is a camera, right? Well, webcams work with browsers and we can also use the MediaStream API um, that allows us to be able to actually get a feed of the webcam itself, so maybe we could take a selfie with that. Uh, the one thing about the protocol that I didn't teach you because I would have run out of time today is that uh, SKP also supports pictures. So you can send <coughs> images, barcodes, uh, some of the modern ones do QR codes. It's pretty amazing. Um, so we can support pictures with this, we just have to figure out how to do that. Uh, most thermal printers use either USB or Bluetooth. Some of them actually use Serial. I discovered that the one I have uses Serial last night and it took all my power not to stay up all night interfacing with it that way. Um, so we can use Web USB, or, Web USB or Web Bluetooth and sometimes Web Serial. So let's look at what the, uh, the media stuff looks like. So if you've ever done, uh, you know, get user media before, this is a very standard 
um, API request to you. But if you haven't seen it before, generally what we do on websites is we specify our options. Do we want audio and video? Do we want one or the other or both? In this case, we just want video. Uh, we can create a stream by asking our navigator objects to um, under the media devices to get the user media. Now that always you know, pops up a permission prompt for people um, and they have to select yes. But if we do get that, I don't have error catching just for simplicity, but yeah, if they do actually um, give us permission, then we can actually just put a, uh, we can put a video element on our web page, and we can actually just pipe the stream to it as the source, which is pretty cool. So a lot of this stuff is just like Lego pieces that we can put together. So what about the, the other side, the printer side? What if we had a thermal printer so that we can take the photo and then like pass it along? So here is the other side of that which is, um, we, again, we have the Navigator object. In this case, we're using WebUSB. Uh, I have given talks on WebUSB before, so if you want sort of the basics of it in a little bit more detail, you can watch one of those. Um, but essentially, we, we do Navigator.USB this time instead of dot, uh, media devices. We request the device. Now, I haven't shown you the USB options, but it's generally um, filtering based on the vendor and product ID of the device just so that the user doesn't have so many things to choose from. Um, and any other options we need to specify there. Uh, we open the device, um, we select a configuration. If you don't know what the configuration is, just start at zero and just keep refreshing the page and eventually the errors will go away. I'm, I'm <laughs> deadly serious. So usually when I buy these things off like Banggood and Alibaba, it doesn't come with a data sheet and I can't find it. So I just, and there are actually tools in the browser which I'm going to show you to help you narrow down like which configuration do I need, which interface do I need. But a lot of the time, if you're just lazy, just keep enumerating them and you'll figure it out. So remember how before I said, you know, our strings can just map to ASCII codes? The next line on line six is basically taking the string hello. It's like splitting it into pieces and then it's finding that actual ASCII code. That allows us to have a numerical array and then we can actually create a, a uint8 uh, array from it, so that's a typed array. Um, and so that's kind of like the data format that we need in order to communicate by this USB bus. So again, just, these are just the vehicles for just getting our payload over there. It's probably the least important bit, but we have a lot of really strong tools to do that. So once we've created our payload from all of our sort of ASCII numbers, um, we actually have it kind of in that really nice byte format that the printer can read, and we do printer transfer out. The first argument is the endpoint number. Again, just keep sending data to random endpoints. You may break your device, but most of the time you won't. Uh, so in this case, it was five. Uh, the printer that I'm going to use today is actually three, endpoint three. It's fun. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, the second argument is the payload. So we just need to send that out. If you're going to do Bluetooth, it's a little bit more complicated. I don't have time to explain the GAP protocol to you today, but if you can understand escape P, I think that it's not too much of a jump for you to understand things like LibUSB and Web Bluetooth. You request de the device in a very similar way. Um, you, again, you can filter on things like device names and things like that. Uh, we do printer.gat. Gat is just part of the more modern uh, Bluetooth 4 protocol. Uh, it's uh, gat.connect. We get a server from that. Um, Bluetooth devices these days are split into these things called services. So a service can be something like uh, a battery level thing or like a heartbeat um, thing if it's like a medical device. Uh, and then within there, there's a there are characteristics. And so they're kind of like the endpoints of USB where you can read from some and write to some and sometimes you can read write. Uh, it just depends on the device. Um, again, you kind of just enumerate all the IDs till the thing does what you want. And I'll show you how to do that. We do exactly the same payload preparation. So we're just getting the ASCII codes from that. We tuck it back into a U8 or into array again, so we have our, our bytes, and then instead of um, USB.transfer out, we have the characteristic, the specific one that is correct. We write the payload value out to it. Cool? Cool. Um, so this doesn't make a lot of sense, but it will in a second. <laughs> um, so about a year ago, um, I had this ridiculous idea to recreate the Game Boy camera and Game Boy printer with web technology, so I invited my good friend Soma to live stream it with me. We actually had no idea what we were doing, but in 90 minutes, we had a very crappy looking prototype and some very funny pictures of ourselves. We just got so sick of posing for photos, we ended up doing very silly things. Um, so that's what the UI looked like 
a year ago, but just recently I packaged it up and tried to make it a bit more legit, so I sort of want to show you that today. Let's have a look, Let's see if all my browsers and everything are behaving. Um, so I'm gonna go to Progressive Web Boy. There we go. So this is my Progressive Web Boy. Um, so this UX makes no sense. I'm so sorry to all the designers and the UX engineers in the room. I'm gonna click start, that bit makes sense. And then hopefully, yeah, there's me. So um, this is me, I can pose in front of it. I actually have a thermal printer like right here. Uh, and so I'm gonna turn that on and plug it in. I'm gonna try web USB just because you know cable connections are always better for demos. Uh, where's QuickTime? I'm actually going to try and do like a split screen thing. Nope. Uh, is it movie? Yes, it's movie. And then FaceTime. Yeah. I mean, I don't want my face, but you get what I mean. Okay, so I'm gonna take a picture of me. Absolutely hate posing for the camera. Oh, it didn't work. Oh no, is it broken? I'm just gonna refresh that. <laughs> okay. I think I made a change, and it was a very silly change. No, that's, that's, that's a spoiler. Okay. Let's see if I didn't break it here. Ah, oh, sweet, okay, we're good, all right, all right. Uh, it's a bit dark, but we will try. Oh, damn it, okay. So um, I have this, the thermal printer, it's actually on, so there's a little light that's gonna blink. Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna press A to print because that's a natural UX button, right? <laughs> okay, so I've already paired with this. Uh, I'm filtering on like the vendor ID and product ID, which I'll show you how to do in a sec. Uh, I go to portable printer and I click connect and then hopefully, <laughs> Oh, cool. So it's a little too dark, but you get the idea. Uh, if I wanted to do that with Bluetooth, I could press select because that makes sense. Uh, and then I have this, so this is the same exact printer, but I wanna show you the limitation of Bluetooth because I think it's really important. So wait till you see this. Wait for it. Oh, hang on. Oh. <laughs> oh my God. And we lost the last payload. Cool. Um, and so uh, Bluetooth is actually limited to being able to send only a certain amount of bytes at a time. So can you can see that divider where it's had to pause and then receive more Bluetooth. That's a bit of a flaw, so just think about that when you're kind of designing interfaces, but it's kind of cool that you can do both protocols with that. So cool, first, first demo done. I wanna show you some debugging stuff because remember when I said you just make stuff up as you go along? Uh, there's actually like a really cool Chrome built-in tool called Bluetooth Internals. All right, uh, I'm gonna go to devices. There are a lot of devices in here, so this is gonna be really hard. <laughs> so I'm gonna scan. I'm pretty sure that I'm just gonna type in printer. No one connect to it, don't you dare. <laughs> okay, all right, so remember how I said there are like services, characteristics that, I'm showing you the Bluetooth one because it's a little bit more mature than the web, uh, your web USB. I'll show you that and you'll be like, oh. Um, so of course, you know, I went through all the services and guess which one it was? It was the last one. So uh, you can click on all the services and look. The services are just basically identified by these unique identifiers. Um, so it's not kind of numerical, like the web USB endpoints, like 0, 1, 2, they actually do have IDs. Guess which characteristic it was? It was the last one. Um, good times. And then my mouse stopped working. Very cool. Okay, that one worked. How about, why? I love that, the, oh, there it is, I just didn't scroll. Okay, 
Good job, Suze. Okay, so here's where you can just basically write to the device. So I'm actually already connected to it. Um, and if you look at the top of my Bluetooth, see it's in bold, so it actually is connected by the browser. I can actually like type in pretty much the same stuff. So um, if you remember from our escape pods, I can literally just write, you know, hello ffconf, and I can write that. Then what I can do is, because this is a special character, I'm going to go into hexadecimal. I'm going to do a line feed, and that's just, um, I think A0 or 0A, I forget. Uh, A0? Someone said it. 0A. 0A, thank you. Okay. Uh, then I'm going to write it, and then you should be able to kind of like see or like hear if you're at the front the line feed. Oh, it didn't do it. Are you sure it's 0A? <laughs> anyway, it should uh, have written. Uh, but if I feed it, it actually says, like, hello, FFFConf, which is really cool. Um, so you can pretty much um, just debug this stuff just by stuffing around and typing stuff. So slow. Um, and so that's what I actually think is really cool about it. You don't necessarily have to just keep, like, changing things in your code and refreshing. Um, so if you want to see the web, uh, the web USB internals, that's pretty cool. Uh, you can do USB-internals. This one is a little harder. So... I have, so it, it's, the manufacturer name is ST Microelectronics, which is actually the chip that they're running the firmware on. It's not actually the company. Um, and the serial number is printer. <laughs> I mean, this is what I mean. How, they just do whatever they want. So like, <laughs> escape, he makes no sense, but it's real. Um, okay, so you can kind of go through and you can see, okay, there's one configuration. So that configuration is probably going to be number zero that I need to get, right? So you can get kind of like little clues. Um, and if you do want to actually send stuff to it, you have to actually know the spec. There's a horrible red warning writing. Um, I thought I bricked my device the other night when I was using this, so I wouldn't recommend it on stage right now when I'm trying to actually do something. Um, but yeah, so that's how, how it actually goes together. You just need to know that little glue protocol in between. You need to learn the, the web APIs. And you can pretty much create a progressive web boy, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so the next demo I want to do, uh, hopefully I'm not tempting fate by doing this, because this is going to be a little scary. Um, I'm actually going to open Chrome Canary because it only works in Chrome Canary. Uh, it's one of those demos. <laughs> so this is going to be fun. Um, so this is a spoiler alert that I had. So why do I keep doing the wrong one? This is the Uploadomatic. So um, I have a, I should not have closed this. I have a, um, an Arduino here, right? Just your run of the mill Arduino. There's one light on it, it's power, right? But it's, it's not blinking or anything. And what I can do now is I have this library that I wrote years ago called AVR Girl Arduino. And it allows you to just like take pre-compiled code for the Arduino and upload it. You can now do that in the browser, which is ridiculous because we have web serial. So I'm going to pick blink.cpp.hex so that when it uploads, uh, there will be a light that will start blinking. Uh, I'm going to click open. I'm going to click upload. Now, th <laughs> this is so new and the spec is so incomplete that it only works in Canary and the filtering on the vendor and product ID doesn't work right now. Um, so I have to like kind of pick the right device from the list. But once I click connect, uh, that's going to start uploading, and then you'll see that this will actually work. So let's, let's do it. Ooh. And then the light is blinking now. So that actually uploaded to the device, which is pretty cool. So just to show you, um, you can get really cool insights out of it, such as these are the exact bytes that make up that blink file that were written to the device as well. I can do everything that I could normally do in the browser, like eventing. So every time a page of memory is written to that board, I actually bubble up an event, and then I listen for that, and then just dump out what that page was, which is pretty cool. So like this is like the potential we have. We can make silly things, but we, we can also make useful things like this so that people can start writing and learning how to code on Duinos in the browser without needing to download any software. They can visit a web page, plug their Arduino in, and, you know, if you add a code mirror to this and a little bit of cloud compilation, 
uh, this is a full ID, which is really exciting. And Visual Studio Online just got released, and I almost nerd sniped myself by trying to make a weird hacky plugin, but I didn't quite get it done today, but that's probably something you'll see from me soon. I'm gonna close Canary because that script pegs my CPU every time I use it. It's not a good idea. Okay. Cool, so I just, I wanted to show you some examples of things that I hope are understandable so that there isn't this like magic in between with the owl. I know that the last demo was, was more complicated because you have to know things about the Arduino, but that web printer thing, Surma and I had the bare bones done in less than an hour and a half. Um, and that shocked me, you know, like he did the webcam bit and I did the USB bit and we glued it together and we were like, this is the future of prototyping for hardware, it's really cool. Um, so just to recap on, on what we just learned, web USB, web Bluetooth, web serial, uh, the last demo I actually used web serial, um, they're cool, but they're really just the vehicles to get the payload to your device, so I just want you to think of it that way, so similar to you making fetch calls, similar to you using something like gRPC to you know, communicate. It's just a way to get it there. And what you need to learn is like, what is the device expecting? And you can learn this stuff online. It's incredibly learnable. So protocols, they're learnable. Um, you can make up your own. I mean, if, if they can make up a skate peer like that, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> you really can. Um, and it, again, it's just bytes over USB or Bluetooth or whatever vehicle that you choose, right? So it's just protocols like all the way down, protocol inception. <laughs> um, so yeah. But then you're just like, why are we bringing all of these operating system tools like into the browser? Like why are we doing this? So I have a serious reason, then I have a silly reason, and then I have a more serious reason, so bear with me. In my opinion, I think that hardware interfaces should be fast to make. They should be cross-platform, uh, just out of the box without having to do any work. They should look good, and they should also be accessible, and that should be easy to do cross-platform as well, which right now, I would say that outside of the browser, these four things are so hard to do, and I've spent time writing C. I've spent time writing Python and hooking it to tkinter and doing all of this stuff, and it is just, it's, it's worse than configuring Webpack, I promise you. It's really not fun. <laughs> Sorry, Sean. <laughs> um, and browsers are a commonly installed application on many computers. You don't have to have these artisanally little like home-rolled pieces of software for people to use your stuff. You should be able to plug it in. WebUSB has this really cool protocol, um, oh, sorry, part of its spec, where if you put a little device descriptor with a URL, Chrome will actually pop up a little thing saying, oh, I think you want to go to this website because this is what the manufacturer of this device is suggesting. So you don't even have to like, know what the URL is, which is incredible. So you know, browsers are pretty commonly installed, easy to use. They just happen to conveniently be uh, easy to rapidly prototype in. You can deploy hot patches very easily. You don't have to submit stuff to the App Store. You don't have to get Mac OS to sign for it and things like that. Um, CSS is incredibly powerful to make things look good uh, and friendly for people so that people stop being afraid of computers. Um, and a consistent accessibility tree just gets better and better and better and we have better tools to be able to debug accessibility than what we have on operating <laughs> system level, which is really cool. Riley Grant is an absolute gem uh, and in the web USB spec, he wrote, uh, these, you know, these kinds of technologies, including with USB, will be good for the web because instead of waiting for a new kind of device to be popular enough, uh, we can just take 10-year-old, 20-year-old devices and we can just be like, no, actually, like, this is what we think we should do with it on the web. And I think that's actually really powerful. So let's talk about uh, something that is actually touching on a topic that Laurie introduced earlier today, which I'm really happy that she introduced that so I'm not the only person. Um, and that's ownership. And that's ownership over our computers, over our data, and over our lives. And I just, I absolutely hate these devices so, so much. Um, they drive me crazy. I can't believe I'm gonna cry about 900 megahertz radio waves right now, but um, <laughs> that'll be really fun to explain to my therapist next week. <laughs> I actually cry almost every day. It's just today it's about 900 megahertz, so that's, that's cool. So in 1985, uh, the Federal Communications Commission 
allocated the frequency band between 902 and 928 megahertz to industrial, scientific, and medical devices, right? The, the band was also allocated to their amateur radio service on a secondary basis. So basically they said, you are free to, do, uh, to use this for things like you know, amateur TV and amateur radio and, and being able to set up local networks in order to communicate with your friends and things like that. Um, so they could use the band as long as they accepted interference and didn't cause interference to primary users. So the primary users are things like medical devices, right? Uh, and emergency services, that's very important. Um, and so this was 1985, okay? This year, um, yes, I read this on Radio Resource International. <laughs> um, this year, the FCC actually proposed sweeping changes for this band. Um, so they proposed the Voluntary Broadband Exchange, um, which is basically just a new, um, it's kind of just like a new use for these unlicensed radio waves, right, that amateurs have been using for years. And you can see here that the last sentence says, the proposal is a win for PDV Wireless, they've changed their name since, um, you know, who's been advocating. So there are these private companies that have been trying to get, you know, um, unfettered access to things like, you know, radio um, frequencies that are in the public interest. Like the amateur radio space was allocated and designed and expressly supposed to be for the public interest, okay? Um, did anyone, I feel like no one talked about this at the launch, but did anyone catch when Amazon released like 50 bajillion devices recently, including things like trackers for your dog called Fetch and all sorts of stuff? And I feel like the main messaging of their release, no one is talking about, and I feel like I'm the only tinfoil hat person who understands like what this actually means, so I'm gonna try and explain it to you. That's a map of Los Angeles behind the speaker. So, Amazon released these devices that allow you to track things and communicate via IoT in your office, uh, in your like home in your office and things like that, in order to find lost things, and they're basically um, moving their devices to communicate on the 900 megahertz network. So they basically gave all of these devices, including ones that people put on their pets, um, to like 700 Amazon employees. They went home and installed things around as if like typical customers were gonna do it. Um, and so they managed to establish a secure low bandwidth 900 megahertz network for things like lights and sensors that covered much of the Los Angeles basin. That is a huge, massive metropolitan region, and they had it, like, I think they had that within, like, a week or, or less time. It's called Amazon Sidewalk. Um, there's the blog post if you want to read about it. Um, I just think that this is the scariest thing I've ever heard, and I actually went home early that day <laughs> because I couldn't deal with it, because Sidewalk's going to be owned, operated, and controlled by a single company. Um, and frequency jammers are currently illegal in many countries. And I just think about how tech has 100% lost its way. Like, we, we are pretending that these devices are actually supposed to be helping people. And these people have no idea that they are actually contributing to a privately owned network of which companies like this can do whatever they want with. Like, this is actual erosion of our rights. It's erosion of our privacy. And we don't, we have done a very bad job at educating the public about this. I just think it's a, this thing in tech that we have majorly, majorly screwed up. And so I have a proposal, and I was talking about this with a friend the other day, and the way that I distilled it down to him was, I want less mass-produced surveillance bullshit and more Harry Potter magic. Like, I want us to take ownership back of devices. I want us to not have these mass-produced things that don't actually really help us, um, but we, we, we give up so much to have that one item in our house. Um, and so a couple of examples of people who I think are doing a really good job of this. Um, uh, first, Samantha Goldstein, she's incredible. She gave a talk recently called Crafting a Connected Home. Uh, she built a stained glass window that has a special uh, pane in it that's made of uh, reactive glass. And so when you send power to it, it goes opaque, it goes like black. And so she uses it to, uh, as a very subtle weather indicator so she knows if she can ride a bike to work. And this seems like so small and so useless, but it's integrated into her life. She completely controls it. It's aesthetically pleasing. And I think that it's just like a step in the direction that we should be going in. We should be 
empowering people to make their own stuff instead of mass producing stuff that we assume works for them. Uh, another example of that is one of my favorite people, which is Simone Yurtz. Uh, she's the queen of shitty robots. That's actually her tagline. But she created something really beautiful, and she had it on Kickstarter um, last year. And it is um, basically committing to a habit of doing one thing every day. And it's this, she, she took the electronics of like a to-do list, you know, like ticking off something every day, and she made it really beautiful. And she, she, she exposed the electronics in, art, in a, an artistic way, and she made this a very personal device that doesn't connect to the internet. It doesn't do anything except what it's supposed to do. And it's something that's actively supposed to be helping you improve your life. It's something that will become part of the furniture. It's something that you can imagine as an heirloom device instead of something that you're just gonna throw out and upgrade the next day. So um, I hope those two examples have kind of got you thinking about this stuff, including the silly progressive web play. But I just wanted to reiterate that like, just, I am absolutely begging you, less mass-produced surveillance bullshit and more Harry Potter magic. <laughs> Believe it or not, this is not the first time I've cried on stage. <laughs> So uh, some resources really quick. This is the photo slide before we finish. So if you wanted to know more about like the stuff that I did, um, you should check out Samantha Gold and Simone Yurtz. I did not put them on the slide, but I, if you come and find me later, I can tell you what their Twitter uh, addresses are. If you want to look at the Progressive Web Boy, it is actually, it's got a service worker. It's very fancy. It is actually a PWA. Um, so you can go to Glitch, and you can just look at all the code that I wrote. It has the Bluetooth stuff, the web USB. The webcam's broken, but if you fork it and remix it and show me how to fix it, Otherwise, I'll redeploy it. Um, escape piece spec, web USB, Bluetooth, and then the web serial spec. So again, thank you so much. Thank you.